This lecture is entitled Restraint and Sedation Titration for Delirium Prevention, Early Mobilization, and Post-Intensive Care Syndrome, or PICS. My name is Marie Pavini. I do have some conflict of interest to tell you about. I am a critical care physician. I am passionate about the problem of physical restraint and chemical restraint. I developed a prototype for a restraint alternative. I was awarded several NIH awards to commercialize the innovation. And I founded Healthy Design, maker of an innovative restraint alternative. There are two learning objectives for this lecture. One is to be able to describe how restraint relates to sedation, delirium, early mobilization, and post-intensive care syndrome, or PICS. And two is to be able to describe how physical and chemical restraint interplay with nursing workflow and patient healing. Looking at this spider web, you can see the interplay between sedation, PICS, immobility, delirium, agitation, and restraint. Each arrow represents studies linking the negative aspects of care. We'll start out talking about restraint and sedation as they relate to safety, workflow, and nurse burnout, and finish up with delirium and post-intensive care syndrome and some non-pharmacologic approaches to reduce the incidence of these terrifying and costly complications. In order to talk about safety, workflow, and nurse burnout related to restraint and sedation, let's first understand restraint and sedation more in depth. This clip shows a typical interaction of a nurse and an ICU patient that is exhibiting signs of discomfort with stimulation. The thing we don't know is, is the patient distressed because he is sick or because he is tied down and delirious from sedation? We actually didn't use restraints that much decades ago, but as we became more advanced technically, their use increased and increased and increased. Let's walk through the problem. First, a critically ill patient becomes confused and starts picking at what is connected to them. So they are restrained and sedated. With current restraints, studies show this means immobility. Restraint and sedation lead to delirium. This results in numerous complications like ventilator-associated pneumonia, ICU-acquired weakness, gut dysmotility, and pressure injury and that results in a longer hospital stay. When patients leave the hospital, it can result in post-intensive care syndrome, which then leads to more frequent readmissions. No restraints with one-to-one -one nursing would be great, except for the fact that we don't have enough nurses. In other countries that have one-to-one -one nursing, Studies show that without restraints, it leads to nurse burnout, and that there is much more use of heavy chemical restraint, either with sedatives or pain medications. A sitter is a great idea, but studies show that patients remember them as guards who are trying to keep them there against their will. And I don't know about your institution, but at our place, we don't have enough staff to fill this role consistently. Plus, many are not allowed to touch the patient and those that can are basically acting as human restraints, doing just what the wrist restraint would have done. Mitt restraints are either tied, untied, or loosely tied. Patients can bite them off, they can squeeze the mitts around the ET tube and remove it, and you don't have direct visualization of things on the hand, like A-lines, pulse oximeters, finger stick areas, and IVs. Elbow water wing style devices can be easily removed by patients. They are not often used. COVID made things much worse. Patients went through wide ranges of conditions, going from talking on the phone to intubated on high vent settings in short periods of time. We have to don and doff PPE to go in and out. This is how we see many critically ill patients restrained and sedated. We figure that they're just so sick, but if we're not always giving them the opportunity, we'll never know when they're ready to start moving their muscles again and clear their own secretions or to stop having hallucinations.
And if we feel better about putting them in mitts and keeping them sedated to make sure they won't reach up to either bite the mitt off or squeeze the ET tube out, then we haven't stopped the harm of delirium. We also don't want patients to be agitated. Some patients can't tolerate being intubated. The question at that point becomes, how do we handle it? Sometimes restraint worsens agitation. Just imagine being really stressed and afraid and then having someone strap you to a bed. I think your stress level would go up. Let's take a break for about a minute and a half and look at these patients who are briefly untied and awakened. These patients represent the compliant, focused patients we wish we didn't have to restrain. Twenty, twenty, twenty-four hours a day Don't want to be sedated Nothing to do and nowhere to go Don't want to be sedated Just let me move my arms now No more bed restraint Hurry, hurry, hurry before I go insane. I can't control my fingers, can't control my brain. Oh, no, 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 no. Twenty, twenty, twenty-four hours a day Don't want to be sedated Nothing to do and nowhere to go Don't want to be sedated Just let me move my arms now No more bed restraint Hurry, hurry, hurry Before I go insane I can't control my fingers I can't control my brain Oh, no, no, no Let's take a look at some studies surrounding restraint and sedation. In this study, it was found that close to 45% of patients who were restrained remembered the experience, and 86% of those were moderately to severely bothered by it. It was also discovered that patients who remembered being restrained were six times more likely to develop PTSD. This study out of Boston found that physical restraints are an independent risk factor for delirium. And this study identified that patient and staff safety concerns were a perceived barrier to early mobilization. In Canada, we learned that physical restraint and excessive sedation are the patient barriers to early mobilization. Let's talk about the concept of sedaction. Sedaction is the balance of sedation and activity that optimizes physical, cognitive, and emotional well-being while assuring patient comfort. This pilot and phase one study found that the exercise restraint, restraint alternative system reduced agitation and sedation, increased safe patient movement, and achieved high satisfaction scores from staff, patients, and families. The Phase II multicenter randomized control trial done at Johns Hopkins, UCSD, and in Vermont just completed enrollment. Outcomes measures include patient movement as measured with actigraphy, agitation and sedation measured by RAS, delirium measured by CAM-ICU, and nurse, patient, and family satisfaction as measured by Quest surveys.
The exercise refraint blocks this pathway between the confused patient wanting to pick at tubes and lines and the restraint and sedation step. By stopping patient entanglement in tubes and lines while allowing a wide range of arm mobility, this can result in less anxiety and agitation and therefore result in much less sedation and more movement and interactions. There are different levels of restraint or refraint, so you can set it however you want and you can titrate sedation. Even when secured closely to the bed, the refraint allows joint mobility and it prevents patients from reaching their endotracheal tube to their hand for self-extubation, making it a better restraint. And when it's not a restraint, like when the exercise bed strap is attached to the bed to allow resistance exercise, you won't have to stop your workflow to document so often. Regulatory bodies and international guidelines tell us to minimize sedation and restraint and maximize early mobilization and anti-delirium measures, all while keeping patients safe. But it's nearly impossible to do with current restraints. ICU staff understand this, and now ICU staff have developed a device to change the lives of more of our patients and our lives for the better. In some patients, in-bed exercise can be allowed, either alone or with staff. Exercise gives those patients a chance to show us that they are capable of understanding and can actually help us to help them. Just let me move my arms now, no more bed restraint. Hurry, hurry, hurry before I go insane. Let's talk a bit about non-pharmacologic approaches to delirium. Restraints were used to help keep tubes and lines in place and to keep everyone safe, but we didn't know about the harm they caused. And by the time we realized it, we were so used to the process that we just figured it was a necessary evil. Doing this to patients does bother us though. Studies have shown that there is nurse burnout and the feeling that we are torturing patients to make them better. We mercifully sedate patients so they won't feel the extreme anxiety of being awake and tied down. We know now that although they look peaceful, patients are actually having quite a bit of mental and emotional activity. And what is being laid down in their minds feels like actual events and so creates disturbing memories that can destroy quality of life after they leave the hospital. Studies link restraint and sedation to self-extubation, readmissions, and pressure ulcers. Here are some excerpts from a video shot by The Atlantic about patient experiences. used to think we're doing these patients a favor by keeping them completely sedated and in a medically induced coma so that they wouldn't have any memory of this difficult time. But that kind of backfired because unfortunately they often do have memories, but they're false memories. They took real life um, stimulus and turned them into something really, really scary. The hallucinations were just unbelievable and so real. They're not nightmares, they're memories. Even when you're sedated, it's not like you're asleep, there is a level of consciousness. The muted sort of restful, peaceful look that some folks can mistaken for they're resting, they're sleeping, when in fact their brain is on fire. You've got a tube down your throat, your wrists may be tied, um, there's nobody around you that you know. Under any other conditions, that would be considered torture. These two women hold my arms down while they shoved the tube up my nose was extremely traumatic. I still have such vivid memories of that. I couldn't move my arms very well until that started happening to me and then I was flailing. We had a young patient and he thought the nurses were restraining his arms and attaching snakes to his arms and that was then drawing blood from him. Even when the patients recover and they know that these things didn't happen, the terror is still so real. I go home and nobody said anything to me about the hallucinations that I would have once I was drawn from all those drugs. This doesn't end when you walk out the door of the hospital. Our patients often say when they follow up with us, I was in the ICU, 
I, I don't think anything happened to my brain. It was uh, a problem with my lungs. The PADIS guidelines give us some recommendations. They suggest that massage, music, and cold therapy be tried to help pain, though there is a low quality of evidence. And also that relaxation and avoidance of bright light be utilized, as well as combinations of other techniques, such as sleep, mobility, and using hearing aids and glasses. To improve sleep, assist control is recommended over pressure control ventilation and a non-invasive dedicated ventilator or a standard ICU vent is recommended for non-invasive ventilation. However, again, the evidence is of low quality. While noise and light reduction is recommended, aromatherapy, acupressure, and nighttime music are recommended against. Pattis tells us that increased agitation, higher benzodiazepine, opioid, and antipsychotic medication use increase risk for delirium or disorientation. The International Committee notes that restraint use can cause an emotional response that can persist after the ICU. They tell us that although certain countries report a restraint-free environment in the ICU, it may be possible that their use of bedside sitters and or pharmacologic restraints is increased. We should bear this in mind when we see studies or sites that describe a lack of physical restraint use. So let's see how we can stop the madness. There have been attempts at using medications for delirium, but none have borne out. So we have turned to non-pharmacologic approaches. And this is where our focus remains. Let's review the features and classifications of delirium. To beat delirium, the behavior must be acute and develop over hours to days. It must include inattention and may fluctuate. Delirium can manifest in different ways. There is hypoactive delirium, where the patient appears almost catatonic. Hyperactive delirium, which can appear like aggression, and mixed can fluctuate. It's important to understand the interrelations of delirium so that we know what we might be able to do to affect it. Therein lies our best hope of prevention and treatment. So how can we try to prevent delirium? We can orient the patient through engagement and cognitive stimulation, create a humane and comfortable environment with reduction of excessive noise, bright lights and restraint, and assist in mobilization. Once delirium has occurred, what can we do to manage it? Here's where understanding the interrelationships of delirium and other factors comes in. We talked a bit about cognitive stimulation. This would include cognitive training, like helping the patient to do something they are used to doing before they were introduced to their new shocking surroundings. Cognitive stimulation, like games or story time, and cognitive rehabilitation, like through the use of diaries. Studies show that cognitive training, like helping patients to do something familiar to them, is the best of these cognitive approaches for mild to moderate Alzheimer's patients. A meta-analysis done does not show evidence of benefit to early cognitive interventions, but let's look at why that might be. Aside from limited sample sizes, there are tremendous variabilities in the interventions and doses. This complete lack of standardization is the very reason we have standards in research. We'll see more about this a bit later on. Along with the PADIS guidelines, SCCM, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, also advocates for interventions that include this multi-pronged approach to altering non-pharmacologic variables. The ABC bundle is a good example of this type of approach as it tackles multiple angles at once. By the way, I am an advocate for including freedom as part of the F in ABCDEF, as it only makes sense that all the music in the world cannot be overshadowed by not strapping the patient down if they are not aggressive and placing themselves or others in danger. 
It also appears that occupational therapy, daylight exposure, and minimizing overnight bedside procedures may help with delirium, and nighttime earplugs have been shown to significantly reduce delirium. Again, we see that physical restraints can worsen agitation. Of course, sedation stops that process, but starts the delirium process anyway through a different pathway. Humanitarian efforts play a role as well. Caring for our patients from a place of love does not go unnoticed. However, more studies need to be done to amass evidence. Emotional interventions are possible. Family and music are among these interventions. One study showed that family voice with recorded reorientation messages reduced delirium. It is not only talking, touching, interaction, and interventions such as music and sleep that play a role in reducing delirium. In fact, equipment is needed to help patients avoid delirium. This includes types of respiratory rescue machines, restraint alternatives, verticalizing beds, and monitors. This is the study that shows us that assist control ventilation is preferred over pressure control for sleep. Physical interventions also factor into delirium reduction. Here, we're talking about pain, sleep, visual, audio, and positioning, as well as mobility and the freedom to move at will. This study, back from 2009 in The Lancet, shows us that sedation reduction with occupational and physical therapy in the earliest days of a critical illness resulted in a shorter duration of delirium. Keeping in the category of physical interventions to reduce delirium, sleep interventions utilized in positive studies included increasing daytime activity and engaging early mobilization programs, as well as clustering overnight care, noise reduction, using music and massage. More of these studies are needed, however. So why are we not seeing better results from the studies we have? There seems to be too much variability as we touched on previously. Population variation, small and variable durations of interventions, and variability of those interventions account for the less than robust results. Just look at the different interventions at the bottom of this slide that we used to try to reach a conclusion of whether non-pharmacologic approaches work. Another reason? Well, let's think about what else was going on with the patients in the study. What was going on with the patient before the intervention was offered? And what happened after the intervention? From the patient's viewpoint, their day can seem like a week of confusion with a small blip of a short intervention that would have had a hard time counteracting the effects of that patient's state of mind. Let's take a look at what happens to these patients after the ICU. Post-intensive care syndrome can be debilitating. It is something virtually invisible to us while patients are in the hospital with us. Yet there is so much we can do to prevent it. We have an ethical duty to recognize when something we are doing to a patient might have severe long-lasting psychological consequences and a duty to minimize those actions or inactions PICS can not only cause debilitating emotional harm, it can result in more frequent readmissions where the same offending actions are likely to reoccur. It can result in a downgrading of life environment, and it can cause tremendous family burden and PTSD for families. PICS clinics are popping up all over now to try to repair the lives of those in whom preventive measures were not performed. It is important to recognize when a patient might be able to benefit from this service and connect them. There are virtual clinics as well as brick and mortar ones. Let's not forget about what all this does to us as medical staff. In general, we went into medicine because we are caring people and want to help others. So when we see so much suffering and don't feel we have enough time or the right tools to do a good job, we burn out. This results in becoming hardened to the suffering of our patients and some feelings that we must deal with when we leave work. 
So what can we take away from this talk? The major component of delirium is inattention. But is it our inattention? We need to go old school to defeat the destructive but avoidable consequences of restraint, excessive sedation, delirium, and post-intensive care syndrome. We must embrace our common sense and treat our patients from a place of empathy. Fortunately, we have amassed more and more evidence to tell us that this is the right track. We must be skeptical of risk management if it is meant to serve the hospital rather than the patient. In stating fall prevention techniques that induce delirium, profound weakness, and post-intensive care syndrome is not the right path. Unfortunately, we have been measuring falls and ignoring the often invisible destruction of our patients' lives. So let's become champions for our patients. Find ways to reduce sedation and restraint through restraint alternatives. Allow patients as much freedom and wakefulness as they can safely handle and keep them mobile from the very earliest opportunity. If we can do this safely, we will find a new joy in our work and feel a great sense of satisfaction in helping our communities. It's why we do this job and we deserve to love it. Thank you.